Okay, welcome to this episode of the Revolution and Ideology podcast. I'm Nick Lee. And I'm Jared Benson. Um, if you want an overview of what we're going to be trying to accomplish throughout the course of this podcast, you can listen to uh, the previous episode, which was our introduction episode. This will be our first full-length episode. Uh, just as a quick refresher, for this portion of the podcast, we're analyzing the possibility of stateless societies, whether or not they can exist and then how we might get there from modern society to some kind of manifestation of society without a state. Uh, in this episode, we're going to be discussing human nature uh, kind of generally, which brings us to sort of the question of why would a podcast with these goals be discussing human nature? Essentially, we're trying to answer for ourselves whether or not human beings are naturally good, whether they're naturally bad, or whether they're a blank slate. Mainly because if we have to conclude that human beings are naturally bad, and not just that, but naturally so bad to such an extent that an authoritative and oppressive state apparatus is required to regulate their behavior in order to protect the freedoms of the other individuals in society, then we would be forced to conclude that a stateless society uh, is impossible. Uh, I'll just go ahead and give you a spoiler alert that we won't be making that conclusion. But that's why we need to go through uh, this uh, exercise. Also, for Jared and I, specifically as individuals uh, within our classrooms and personally, we tell a very specific story of the origins of inequality in human societies. And so this was really just our opportunity to do actual real research uh, into this arena that we had never really done before and make some conclusions for ourselves and uh, analyze this stuff on our own. I won't speak for Jared, but my experience in grad school in uh, sociology really was, this came for me, the origins of inequality. My theories on this came from a Marxist perspective. That's what I got in grad school, and that's what I've sort of been perpetuating myself in the classroom and personally. Uh, and I really just wanted to take this opportunity to kind of analyze that and see what was really going on uh, you know, in the 150-ish years since Marx was writing, uh, and look at some of the anthropological research. Um, so that's what we're going to be doing. Uh, I will admit that I, throughout my research process, sort of researched the latest anthropological and archaeological uh, publications on this topic and then worked backwards from there, which I know is not really a philosophically sound way to make conclusions. I should have started at the very beginning and worked my way forward, but let's be honest, it's 2019 and none of us have time for that. Uh, so we could have gone all the way back to an Aristotle or uh, some other philosophers and worked our way forward, but that wouldn't be a good use of anyone's time. So we are going to start with uh, Thomas Hobbes, and then we're going to work our way forward, though we'll be fast-forwarding quite a bit throughout this time period. We're going to touch on Hobbes, uh, Locke briefly, spend some time really discussing Rousseau, and then we're going to get to sort of the latest uh, research. So Starting with Thomas Hobbes, he was an English philosopher, uh, lived 1588 to 1679. He's most well known for uh, his work Leviathan, um, or the full title, which just I'll reveal right now. I actually love the title of sort of Enlightenment era works because they're so long and entertaining. So the full title of Leviathan is actually Leviathan or the Matter, Form, and Power of a Commonwealth, Ecclesiastical and Civil. That's the full title. This was written in 1651. Um, <laughs> Hobbes is sort of the first philosopher to present this hypothetical, what's now known as state of nature, uh, trying to sort of hypothesize what men, uh, human beings, would be like in a state which was, quote-unquote, with huge air quotes, uncivilized. Right, what men uh, would be like before any kind of sort of socialization by civil society? Um, I do want to briefly just caveat that I'm probably going to use the term man and men extensively throughout this podcast. Uh, just know that I mean human beings and I'm trying to not be patriarchal, but just out of habit that's going to happen, so just be aware of that. Um, so Hobbes sort of presents this hypothetical man prior to civilization, and we get an idea of what that's like. So I don't want to dwell on Hobbes too long. I have like tons and tons of pages of notes and full quotes, but I actually want to try to not read any of those so we can get onto Locke and then eventually Rousseau, which is where I want to focus. Uh, so in general, 
Hobbes presents in Leviathan a pessimistic view of human nature. He says that in their natural state, human beings are in constant war with one another. Now, not warfare like we view modern warfare with like tanks and artillery and etc. But they are violently battling with one another. Interestingly, though, for Hobbes, this isn't because human beings are physically unequal. He actually says the war is a result of the fact that human beings, uh, when all is said and done, their physical and mental capacities are overall quite equal. And he says this is what leads to this warfare. Because if human beings had an incredible amount of uh, differences in strength and mental capacities, there actually wouldn't be a lot of warfare because it would be very clear who the stronger and the weaker were, uh, both mentally and physically. And so no one would be motivated to fight with one another. But because overall, on average, human beings in their natural state are fairly equal, this leads to this warfare. And he says basically the natural state is constant fear and violence. Um, he has a famous quote that says, uh, So the, nat the nature of war consisteth not in actual fighting, but in the known dispositions thereto during all the time. There is no assurance to the contrary. So there's war all the time. And then he says, The life of man is solitary, poor, nasty, brutus, and short. And he's sort of well known for that last quote, uh, solitary, brutus short, violent, etc. So that's how he sums up sort of his uh, state of nature. He says, then, as a result of this violence, this is how we get to a civilized society and then eventually uh, inequality. He says, eventually people, that human beings naturally want to uh, sort of escape this state of warfare and violence, and we have a natural inclination to seek out peace. So he says, a result of this natural uh, desire for peace, humans place their individual powers into one man or a group of men, into a sovereign. Um, this is, Hobbes used the term commonwealth. So he says men decide to give up their individual power and put their power into one man or a council, he uses the term, a council of men to protect one another. He says this can happen two ways. It can either be through force, so they can be forced to give up their powers and invest their power in the sovereign, or they can voluntarily uh, give their powers, concede their powers to the sovereign. Um, so what do you think about that? Thomas Hobbes is a very negative man. Um, I think we mentioned this, I, I mentioned this last time we had this kind of discussion when we were going to explore honestly, what you are going to be researching for this part, being the sociologist and digging into social theory, and, and, and maybe I would be able to add in some historical examples and details. One of the problems I see with a lot of the analysis from pre, immediate pre, during, and post-Enlightenment era thinkers is, is, is they are approaching things from a very narrow, singular perspective, in my opinion. And, and, and we talked about it, what it would be like if we talked about human nature from a different perspective regarding philosophers. I have much more respect for the, the Lao Tzu, Rumi, Omar Khayyam, like these other people from outside of, to be blunt, Europe. Um, I think part of, and, th and we're going to be guilty of this throughout this podcast so that the whole audience is aware, that we are, again, ideologically speaking, products of our time and our socialization and conditioning. And I think Hobbes, in these, in, in to be blunt, these very negative associations, brutish, violence, constant warfare, and willing to cede some of their personal liberties and freedoms for more or less um, uh, an engagement with peace, I think, and we see those later, honestly, with, with people I can use in history, the Thomas Paines of the world and the Ben Franklins. And so, I mean, more famous here in the United States. They, those ideas were not theirs either. They learned from, from these prior Enlightenment thinkers. I think what we see here is, is a product of, of his time. And, and you already spoiled it for everybody. We don't necessarily view, you and I, don't necessarily view humanity in the same light. But I do think experiencing, because the Enlightenment era is fueled by some historical circumstance, that would naturally, if you're observing, lead people to believe that humans are a certain way. This is also during the peak of the colonial period, right, where Europeans are going around the world and, and, and brutally exploiting others. Now, where Hobbes stood on that, I personally do not know. I've never been a big fan of his. 
This also happens to be during the transatlantic slave trade. So, I mean, and again, this is fresh off of wars throughout Europe, a, a, a continent that at that point had known nothing but war, basically, since the collapse of, of Rome. And we would even argue that, that under Rome, regardless of what people learn about the Pax Romana, there was conflict there as well. Um, so I think, again, yeah, Hobbes' pessimism is because he is a product of his time. And, and I don't know... Uh, maybe you, you did some research on this. I don't know what kind of research he had available to him of societies outside of Europe. So did he ever experience what maybe indigenous societies in North America look like regarding their social organization, how they interacted, or what aboriginal Australians or, I mean, name any other, other, other group of people from another continent that had not been exposed to that type of, of warfare? That's actually the first critique I have written down here for Hobbes is that He's writing in the 1600s. It's based on, as far as I can tell, literally no actual research, no anthropological real-life evidence of what is going on in other societies. However, I do want to give him a little bit of an out because he actually admits to this throughout the work. So he says that this is purely a hypothetical thought experiment. So while I want to critique him for the fact that it's not based on any evidence, he kind of gets a free pass because he admits this throughout, and he should sort of get a free pass from us because it's the 1600s. Obviously, there have been incredible advances uh, since that time in anthropology and archaeology that would inform his opinions a little bit more. So while I agree with you that I, I disagree with what he says about humans being brutish, um, I think we sort of kind of have to, unfortunately, discount his entire opinion because it's not based on any research. I do think that it's a valuable thought experiment, but... Uh, we, I don't know how seriously we can take it, which also leads me to my next critique that he says human beings in their natural state are wholly solitary. Uh, and he gives accounts of like solitary man and what he would do. We now know that this is, I mean, it's just utter nonsense that no human being exists or ever existed out anywhere by themselves. That's just not a thing. Just basic bi biological knowledge of the fact that a child needs its mother, at least in the very beginning of human life. There was never a man uh, just out by themselves. Um, Is it metaphorical then? It's possible. Yeah, it's possible. I don't know. Um, when we get to Rousseau, he actually says the same thing. So we'll, maybe we'll see a little bit more when we get to Rousseau. But it's possible that it is sort of, yeah, like you said, metaphorical. One thing that I do, and this is the last thing I want to touch on in Hobbes, and I'm going to read kind of a long quote here, uh, because this is what really discredits Hobbes, maybe not his view of human nature so much, but just kind of his view on government, etc. He seems to be promoting tyranny, at least that's one of his critiques. Uh, so I'm going to read a quote, and then we can dissect it for a second. He says... Well, I mean, even before you do, he wouldn't be the first. I mean, Aristotle... No, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, okay. I just mean, for me, I think he's an asshole if he's doing All right, that. Right, I mean, right, yeah, right, yeah, for sure. I okay. mean, he was not the first. No. <laughs> he says, and I quote, there be other names of government in the histories and books of policy, as tyranny and oligarchy, but they are not the names of other forms of government, but of the same forms misliked. For they that are discontented under monarchy call it tyranny, and they that are displeased with aristocracy call it oligarchy. So also they which find themselves grieved under a democracy call it anarchy, which signifies want of government. And yet I think no man believes that want of government is any new kind of government, nor by the same reason ought they to believe the government is of one kind when they like it and another kind when they dislike it. So he basically is saying, end quote, he's basically saying that tyranny is merely a king disliked. That is, when people are critical of the government, they actually don't want a different form of government. They merely want that government in some uncorrupted uh, version. Everyone's looking for the benevolent tyrant or the, you know. Yes. Or, like, if they're critiquing democracy, they don't want another form of government, they just want an actual uh, democracy. Uh, this is so questionable for me for so many reasons. Obviously, we teach a class, and our expertise lies in revolution, so there are very real-life examples of when someone claims tyranny, they don't actually want a monarchy. They very, in real terms, want something different. And then I have written here, the fact that Hobbes lives in the era of the English Revolution and still believes this to be true is super odd, and I don't understand it. But it wasn't worth me like going into more research to figuring out. I'm sure that there's some explanation for his political stances. I just didn't care enough to write it, to read it, uh, research into it anymore. Uh, but for me, that just, I don't know why, I picked that quote out as kind of just asinine in my opinion of his claim is that no one actually ever wants to change their government. 
They just want a pure form of whatever government they are under. But maybe that pessimism is necessary, right? I mean, we make that critique in modern eras all the time, right? Mm-hmm. Like, clearly, the modern Western world, is, as much as we champion the idea of democracy, none of them actually operate as democracies. Mm-hmm. England, France, the United States, they're, they're not full-blown democracies. They're representative at best, and that's even highly questionable when we right. look at how campaigns are funded and so on and so forth. Our people ever really screaming that they want democracy. And here's the thing. Why do we let it happen? Maybe Hobbes is right. Maybe I don't know. We let that happen. We know it happens. There's not a citizen, and especially the UK or the United States, is not not aware that corporations are arguably more powerful, or at least choosing our politicians, Mm -hmm. and yet nobody seems to want to do anything about it. Maybe they're too comfortable or they're scared or whatever. And that begs the question... Do we, at least if using those two specific examples, the UK and the United States, do we even really want democracy? Are we just cool putting those decisions on somebody else, letting it run on autopilot so I can get to work and then get home and Netflix and chill? Yeah. I mean, as long as it doesn't negatively impact our right. daily lives. Yeah. Right? yeah. So I guess, it, yeah, yeah. And we're on a long path of like, how privileged are we that we have the freedom to say that? But that's a whole other episode. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, anyways, I just hated that. So for Hobbes, humans in a state of nature are violent and brutal, and they live in a, a constant warfare and fear. And in order to escape that fear, they are willing to cede their power to this central sovereign, the commonwealth. And that's how we get the origins of society and at the same time, uh, inequality as people that fill the, fill the roles of whatever that sovereign looks like, they gain more power than others. So that's Hobbes in a nutshell. Moving on to John Locke, also an English philosopher. He lived 1632 to 1704. And this is by far one of the best titles that I love. um, And that he is probably, I guess, most famous for. It's the two treatises of government. However, the full title, which I love, is the two treatises of government. In the former, the false principles and foundation of Sir Robert Filmer and his followers are detected and overthrown. The latter is an essay concerning the true original extent and the end of civil government. That's Bre- the full time. Brevity, not a thing in the no. Enlightenment. Not a thing. <laughs> so this is published in 1689. Um, we actually aren't concerned here at all with the first treatise where he basically shreds Sir Robert Filmer. Um, I actually do a whole lecture on this in our ideology class when we talk about divine right of things, uh, divine right of kings. Um, maybe we'll do an episode on that uh, later on. But uh, it is actually one of, it's not one of my favorite like philosophical essays or anything, but as far as like taking someone's ideas, is, which is what he's doing, he's taking Robert Filmer's ideas and just line by line utterly destroying them. Uh, I just appreciate that. Um, <laughs> but So we're concerned here with the second treatise, which is talking about government, etc., um, so just summing up Locke uh, as quickly as we kind of possibly can, um, he basically presents a more optimistic view of human nature. Uh, and for him, he discusses at length private property. So while for Hobbes, the state of human nature is war, man against man, full of fear and violence, for Locke, actually, the state of nature is freedom and equality. He also says that Private property exists in the state of nature. And this is a key argument for Locke, because for him, the state comes into existence in order to protect private property, rather than the other way around. Many uh, narratives have... Hold, uh, hold, hold. When, yeah. he said, when we say nature, are we talking like the original nature of man? Or yeah, just exactly. Nature We're still talking general? about state of nature. Yeah. Like nature, macro nature. Yes. I mean, okay. both. Okay. The answer is both. Man okay. in the state of nature, out in nature. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I would get, I would say the common narrative is kind of that the state crops up, and then as a result, private property exists. Locke gives the opposite argument. He says that private property comes to be a thing, and then men are motivated to enter into the social contract. We'll start using that term here. Um in order to protect their property. So that's a key argument for him. And for him, the root of inequality is actually currency. So for him, bartering is fine um, and just because what you are bartering is perishable. So for him, there is a natural law that prevents inequality in the beginning, and that is the fact that what you might gain from nature spoils. And there's a natural law for men not to do this. 
So he's basically arguing that there's no surplus, there's no accumulation in the state of nature because why would I possibly pick all of the apples from the tree knowing that I can only eat whatever, 10 a day or something, and have the 100 others just die? That men in the state of nature would have zero motivation to do that. But he does say that that apple is your property. And he talks about the fact that if a man takes an apple from a tree, that that becomes his property. He owns himself and he owns his labor, and so that is now his property. Uh, and that no other man would really have a right to that property, though he discusses, like, it's basically because why would you? Because the state of nature is a state of plenty, so why would I invest my energy fighting some man for the apple he just plucked from the tree when I can literally go to, in, hypothetically, any tree and pick an apple? So why would I do that? Um, so private property exists before the state comes into play. And he says that man is able to overcome this natural law, this limit of spoilage, uh, as a result of currency. And so currency is what is the root of inequality for him because currency does not spoil. So people can then begin to hoard currency where the hoarding of naturally spoilable items was impossible, or at the very least it went against natural law. You wouldn't do that because it was, it was dumb, basically. Um, but you can hoard currency, and he says this is the beginning when men can start to possess more than others because they can hoard the hard currency. So what do you think about that? I think hoarding anything that is representative of something else that cannot spoil. I actually do agree with that. I think the idea of currency specifically, I'm not sure if he's using again that word just because that was the word that he wanted to use in, in the 1680s. But now I will throw the history card down a little bit. While there was coinage in like ancient empires and so on and so forth, whether or not that was like the macro form of exchange uh, predominantly among many people, that that's highly questionable. We know that. So So currency might not be the best terminology there, but some sort of representative symbolic power, right? That that I definitely can see uh, and agree with, right? There, like I said, yeah. coins and currency, as we know it, was were not a thing in in the ancient Egyptian kingdom. Mm. That was not like the common exchange. There was yeah. no like Wall Street of Memphis, right, uh, or anything along those lines. So I, I think he's a little bit bit wrong there, but I do agree with him that the idea of hoarding pre seeds the establishment of state. I do agree with that. I for I do agree with that. That mm -hmm. that people began to hoard whatever we want to call it in our model that I that I do the lecture on when we do the social pyramid, I call it surplus, but that's fine. I do think that hoarding began before the firm establishment of state. Okay, so you you didn't read this, but you actually touched on something that's key is the the use of coinage and currency and what you said is the it represents something else. I'm going to read this passage just because that's what he's talking about specifically is something that represents something hard that doesn't spoil that represents something else. So he right. says, it is plain that the consent of men have agreed to a disproportionate and unequal possession of the earth. I mean, out of the bounds of society and compact for in governments, the law regulated, they having by consent found out and agreed in a way how a man may rightfully and without injury possess more than he himself can make use of, by receiving gold and silver, which may continue long in man's possession without decaying, or the overplus and agreeing those metals should have a value. So what he says is actually, the fundamental inequality is the fact that men have consented to a value of currency that is disproportionate to what it actually represents. And Correct. that's the inequality. And I think the missing piece there that we talk about in our classes all the time, specifically when we're talking about narrative, is, is the development of a faith. And I think that's what he might be missing, and he may go into that later. But how is that faith developed? So if it's not dollars and pounds and yen in, in, in the ancient world, it is gold or it is silver mm -hmm. or if it's acreage or it's uh, irrigation plots, whatever it is that is that representative, how are they able to convince these people that are hoarding masses of people that this gold at that time is relatively useless besides the fact that it was yeah, pretty? Which you actually mentioned. Yeah. Right. How are they able to convince the masses that somehow this representative useless metal at that time, just because of its scarcity, somehow represents X amount of ears of, of I was about to say corn, but then I'd be in the wrong region of the world, right? But yeah. regardless, you know what I understand, crop X or land this, mm -hmm. right? That that would be very important. Um, so I will say, though, that you're, that 
what you just said, your perspective comes from, has to include some all-knowing kind of elite that would convince the peoples that this is valuable. For him, much like for Hobbes, where all, quote-unquote, all men consent to putting their power in the sovereign, for Locke, quote-unquote, all men agree to the terms of the currency. I, I don't agree with that. I think that had to be coerced. Again, gold specifically, again, it's use, it's useful now in electronics and so on and a whole host of other things. But at that time, you did not make your weapons out of it. You did not make your tools out of it. It, it had no real utilitarian value, mm -hmm. at least not that I'm aware of. Yeah. So to get all men in whatever society or women to, to consent to making that be representative of all of their other uh, labor all of their other actual useful products, whether that is food, water, whatever it is, I, that had to be, I think, an coerced, if not outright. Enforced. Okay, since you just mentioned labor, I'm going to read the, actually the first part of the quote yeah. I just read because he says exactly that. But since gold and silver, being little useful to the life of man in proportion to food, raiment, and carriage, has its value only from the consent of men, whereof labor yet makes in great part the measure. So he says in the beginning... This currency, whatever it was, that represented something else, he says in the beginning it represented the labor that went into making whatever was going to be traded by the, from the currency. But he says that's when the inequality comes in, is when the currency starts being worth more than the labor that went into whatever you would be purchasing. Or I guess it doesn't be more, it could be more or less, but it's an unequal amount. Um, the last thing for Locke here is that uh, where Hobbes... Uh, admits that his man in the natural state is hypothetical, Locke claims that humans did actually live in his state of nature, and he actually says that they do still in various parts of the world. So he actually claims that this is real in real life, both in history and still in parts of the world where man have not yet been quote-unquote civilized. Uh, so what do you think about that? I appreciate that Locke was willing to, to, to look outside his own European lens for a brief period of time, and, and I would agree full, wholeheartedly with him, used based on the examples I critique Hobbes with, whether we're talking about Aboriginal Australia or Sub-Saharan Africa or North America, um, or North America pre-full-blown colonization. Those types of things, I think, yeah, I, I would agree with Locke. I would disagree with this very specific notion that many of those societies had what he called private property. Mm -hmm. Most property, and it, well, I don't want to make blanket statements about three different continents containing thousands of different types of people, First Nations, and so on and so forth. But in so, at least some of those societies that I've studied, they very specifically had things in place to ensure there was no private property. Property was commonly held. Yeah, so one thing that I, because I, I was thinking in those terms when I was reading Locke too, and I think that where I was having problems is using our conception of private property now. Very clearly, no societies had that. But what he says is that, he doesn't say this, but it's much different than what we think of as private property. It was more a natural state of private property that had to do with natural rights and natural law. Whereas, like, to go back to this apple example, because he uses it. Um, if someone pulls an apple from a tree... They've invested their labor and their time into that apple, and so it's just naturally their private property. Not private property that's like backed by a state, etc., but that they have a claim to that property that now some other man does not have an equal claim to. And in some of those societies specifically, if that man or woman ate that apple or only half of that apple, set that apple down and went on to pursue something else, that apple is no longer that person's property and that apple is now the common property of the next person that wants to come along and mm -hmm. eat it. That's fine. That's what I would, I would say and you think yeah. he would agree with that. I don't know. And that's how it would absolutely work in some of these other yeah. societies, right? Uh, I, for me, I'm drawing right on... Uh, work in Daniel Richter's book, The Ordeal of the Long House, The Iroquois League of Peace and Power. I'm looking at that right now. That's what I'm thinking. Of. I mean, he does talk about spoilage, right? So he would probably say that, I mean, he does say that man has no right to hoard enough of anything so that it would naturally spoil. So in your example, if someone he eats half the apple and they put the apple down and they leave it, then yes, he would agree that anyone else could come and eat the rest of that apple because it's going to spoil. We might get into some kind of disagreement if like, the person put the half of the apple down to come back to it in an hour or whatever, but what an hour in the weeds, like who gives a shit about that, right? We've got a food fight. Yeah. Yeah. It's bad news. <laughs> okay, so that's Locke. Now on to Jean Jacques Rousseau. 
who was French, who lived 1712 to 1778, which, by the way, once we read the next work, uh, I had never in my life thought of calling Jean-Jacques Rousseau J.J. Rousseau. Yeah, I saw but that. After, just, yeah, yeah. That, was yeah I, I thought that made was me laugh, sweet. and now I yeah. love it. So yeah. I'm gonna, I have to do that J. J. all the Rousseau. time. J.J. Rousseau. It's so, like, less, like, it makes me so much more happier it to read It humanizes him. It brings exactly. him down to us. Yes. It brings him down to the proletarian yeah. level, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, JJ. I know him. Yeah, anyways. Um, so he's most famous for two things. Um, the first is Discourse on the Origin and Basis of Inequality Among Men, which he writes in 1754, and then On the Social Contract or Principles of Political Rights, which is 1762. I would actually say he's probably most famous for On the Social Contract, and I will admit that was the only one that I had read before doing this research. However, I have no idea how I have never read the Discourse on the Origin and Basis of Inequality, which is, by the way, referred to as the second discourse. He had another discourse before that. Um, I had never read the second discourse, which I have no idea why, because it is so much more entertaining to read than the social contract. And the social contract, he writes it like an asshole, I mean, honestly. And I don't know why. It's, what, eight years apart. But the discourse is so much easier to read. And so much, I, I feel like it's more, like, humble. I don't know. Anyway, so that's what I read. Um so the Discourse on the Origin and Basis of Inequality Among Men was written in response to a question proposed by the Academy of Dijon, which was, they basically wanted essayists to write in and answer this question. So this is the question uh, that he's answering. This is their question. What is the origin of the inequality among mankind and whether such inequality is authorized by the law of nature? Basically, what we're trying to answer now is the question that the Academy of Dijon uh, asked. Yeah, people have been asking it for, yeah. for millennia. Rousseau actually didn't win the contest. He came in second. Hmm. I don't know what the first thing is. I looked it up, but I didn't read it, so it's irrelevant for right now. But maybe it's way more entertaining than this, and we should have read it. I don't know. Um, so we're going to read some quotes from Rousseau so we can get an idea of what he is getting into, mainly because Rousseau's hypothesis becomes dominant in the discourse for the next couple of hundred years. Uh, still to this day, we might even argue. So first he presents two types of inequality. He says, I can see that there are two kinds of inequality among the human species. One which I call natural or physical because it is established by nature and consists in a different age, a difference of age, health, bodily strength, and the qualities of the mind or of the soul. And another which may be called moral or political inequality because it depends on a kind of convention and is established or at least authorized by the consent of men. This latter, uh, this moral or political inequality, uh, consists of the different privileges which some men enjoy to the prejudice of others, such as that of being more rich, more honored, more powerful, or even in a position to exact obedience. Okay, so he has two different types. He says basically, uh, it's a waste of time to try to analyze natural inequality. So, quote, it is useless to ask what is the source of natural inequality because that question is answered by the simple definition of the word. Uh, end quote, which I kind of like. So he's saying, why would we try to analyze yeah, there's, there's, inequalities there's, there's, of natural a, natural inequality? It's naturally occurs. It's, it's so he focuses uh, on social inequality, which is what we're trying to get into uh, here anyways. Um, he goes against Hobbes' version of men being brutish, etc., violence, and he actually kind of agrees with Locke that says men live in a state of freedom. He actually promotes natural, quote-unquote, men, uh, above civilized men. So I'm going to read this quote. He says men in the natural state were actually stronger, etc., than uh, men in the civilized state. So he says, quote, We should be aware, therefore, of confounding the savage man with the men we have daily before our eyes. Nature treats all the animals left to her care with a predilection that seems to show how jealous she is of that right. The horse, the cat, the bull, and even the ass are generally of greater stature and always more robust and have more vigor, strength, and courage when they run wild in the forests than when bred in the stall. By becoming domesticated, they lose half these advantages, and it seems as if all our care to feed and treat them well serves only to deprave them. It is thus with man also. As he becomes sociable and a slave, he grows weak, timid, and servile. His effeminate way of life totally engraves... Uh, sorry, in innervates his strength and courage. To this, it may be added that there is still a greater difference between savage and civilized man than between wild and tame beasts. For men and brutes, having been treated like treated alike by nature, the several conveniences in which men indulge themselves still more uh, 
than they do their beasts are so many additional causes of their deeper g- degeneracy. What do you think about that? Agree. I mean, we've, we've dabbled in it a little bit uh, in our discussion that I am, uh, we're also working on a, a book potentially, where I'm going through some of the edits and we had this discussion called Ideology and Power and we were dabbling in this idea and I brought up brought up the notion that in 2019, let's say some sort of apop- ap- apocalypse takes place. Who are the most useful people you would want? And it's actually, the funny thing is, it was a joke. It's not me or Nick. I, no one cares. No one wants a lesson on history, and no one cares about social theory. You're going to want a hunter. You're going to want a farmer. You're going to want probably a doctor or whatever. You're going to want somebody with a skill. And it is inarguable, in my opinion, that people that were outside civilization, I refuse to use, I'm actually wondering if that was a direct translation from the French that he used the word savage. It wouldn't surprise me from the 18th century that he did, but I won't use that word. (laughs) That people in these societies outside of, of states had exponentially more skill. He uses strength, but that strength is tied to those skills. That person could survive and build a shelter and garner their own water and get their own food. If we fast forward to the 18th century where he's living in France or even the 21st century where we're living uh, currently in the United States, how many skills do we have that are actually real world and applicable that we could use uh, to survive? Very few. And it's not an accident that our systems of power have stripped that. They remove those things from the education system. It makes us dependent and that's the goal of any state so i 100 percent agree it also reminds me real quickly of all people uh, uh teddy kaczynski's uh industrial society in its future where he is actually engaging this idea of power process and i think rousseau speaking to that now whether or not kaczynski had ever read rousseau i, I don't know um maybe we can interview him in, in prison or whatever but but it is that's that idea of power process the argument was essentially that we are all Uh, having some problems in our society. We have anxiety and depression and so on and so forth because we're so far removed from the power process of what we were naturally. So yeah, I I definitely agree with what Rousseau is saying there. He actually does go on. I didn't have it here because it was just long, but he gives specific examples kind of just to support exactly what you just said that, like, you know, men in his quote unquote, I'll use this term even though, you know, I disagree with it too. Men in their quote unquote savage state could spot a ship on the horizon, et cetera. He gives specific examples of all these things that we now can't do. He says they easily can do. They can pull a branch off a tree where we would require an axe and like all of these things. So whatever. Um, the next quote I have goes into the conversation we actually had last week of like trying to imagine this man in the natural state and like what would their instinctual desires be. He attempts to answer that question. He says, his desires never go beyond his physical wants. The only goods he recognizes in the universe are food, a female, and sleep. The only evils he fear are pain and hunger. I say pain and not death, for no animal can know what it is to die. The knowledge of death and its terrors being one of the first acquisitions made by man in departing from an animal state. So he says, there's only three things that men want. Food, a female, and sleep. And there's only two real evils, and that's pain and hunger. So what do you think about that? So the first thing I gotta call, I get it, he's writing in the 18th century, he's in France, but... Like right there, that that's that's full blown patriarchy. Like that 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 that's the first thing that that's off putting right there. Because again, at least through some of our research, historically speaking, maybe a little bit anthropologically speaking, we know that that quote unquote man in his natural state actually in most of those societies they were matrilineal, where women were, uh, if not in direct power, had much more decision-making power than men in many cases. And if they, men did have any decision-making power, it was only under the consent of the matrons themselves. So that right there, I think, is, is the first thing that... I, I well, hang on. I think you're reading way too much okay. into his use of the word female. But you don't know this. Is he, just, is he just saying we want to procreate? Yes, 100%. Whether, whether, exactly. whether we're women or men? Yes. If that's the case, then yeah. I mean, I would agree that one of the yeah carnal desires, whether it's depending on what our audience feels, God-given or evolutionary-given is to procreate, pass on our genes. So yes, I would agree with the idea of procreation. He actually but, talks but about the this language he's using is, is, is yeah. interesting. And again, it, it's hard to critique somebody in the 18th century or 19th century, 18th century. Yeah, but I have to. So that's what he, yeah, he's yeah. talking about procreation. We okay. want food, procreation, and sleep. That's it. Um, what do you know about the next thing? Because I know you're going to disagree with this because we've disagreed with this before. Not that I fully agree with this, but he says, I didn't bring it up here because it's so long, but he talks a lot about language, etc., and its importance in the civilization of men over time. Um, but he says that 
men in the state of nature do are not aware of their own death. He says, no animal can know what it is to die. The knowledge of death and its terrors being one of the first acquisitions made by man in departing from an animal state. I think this is crucial because many people would argue that men in their quote unquote natural state, that would be one of the fears that motivates their behavior is this trying to survive. So what do you think about that? I mean, hey, the way you frame that last part, yeah, I mean, I would agree that, that death, uh, it, fear of death is a motivator. I would fully disagree with that humans and current humans or modern humans or homo sapiens sapiens or whatever are the only ones that actually can acknowledge what death means. That's, that's absolute nonsense. And again, maybe he's a product of his time. Science and the study of, of animal life had not come uh, very far at that moment, moment in time, and what little had come was a clear like taxonomy, a ranking tier system where clearly humans were at the top and everything else exists to serve us. Uh, you do an entire lecture on positivism and the scientific theories of that era, Carl Linnaeus and so on and so forth. But but yeah, I, I, I think that's 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 the first thing. Again, when you make that assumption because you're a product of your time, and again, that right there does... I mean, it draws some of his theories, or makes holes in some of his theories, in my opinion. You, you cannot assume that man is the apex of consciousness. I, I don't know that I can believe that. I may get some heat over that, but I don't, I don't know that. We don't know that. We don't, we don't know that. We assume it because we want to believe it because we've done all of these wonderful and horrible things throughout history. But I don't know that. And, you know, whatever. So you think that men in their natural state, when they're experiencing pain or hunger, they're those physical manifestations are related to an emotional and psychological fear of death that I experience hunger. And I know as a result, if I don't satisfy that experience, I am going to die. And that's why I have anxiety over it. Yeah, I think I, well, yes, I did. That's definitely whether again, like that, that's driven. I mean, there's going to be instinct, right? There's going to be instinct there. I feel bad and I want that feeling to go away and uh, that feeling will go away because I consume this apple or I kill a squirrel and eat it or whatever it is I'm doing in my natural state. Fine, so be it. But I do think that man, and not just man, numerous species, many parts of sentient life, also recognize that there is a bigger picture there, that it's not just about relieving this immediate discomfort, that there are long-term ramifications, and those ramifications being the ceasing to exist, uh, if we, I don't handle the situation. Okay. I want to skip over that, even though I think that's a huge point of contention that needs so much more debate, but I don't know if either of us are qualified to have that conversation, so. Yeah, and that, that, that is, I, I would agree that I am not a biologist or a zoologist or, so I, Because you know. even though I fully agree with you on the fact that many species that we don't admit are sentient beings, I mean, we as like humanity are probably sentient beings. It's a stretch for me to understand that like me and a lion both experience the physical pain of hunger, but does the lion associate that with the long-term ramifications of that they will cease to exist if they don't satisfy that? sensation why I don't couldn't know. they I, I get that science i'm not saying it, that yeah. they couldn't yeah. i just don't know if i believe it and maybe there know. is a tiered system we know for a fact that like whatever we want to call them if we tier animals based on what we assume their intelligence is like an elephant in theory would be higher on that level than a lion mm -hmm. and maybe the elephant gets it we know they mourn their dead yeah well uh, same thing with orcas and dolphins and so on and so forth mm -hmm. yeah so maybe maybe there is but i hate i hate even having a tiered system yeah i hate that that's for me, like, it's, I don't know what my personal, like, I can admit that animals mourn their, or elephants mourn their dead, and that many animals in the wild, if they pass a deceased member of their species, will have all these things, right? They'll cover them up, or what, like, all of this stuff. I just cannot make the connection between that and, like, a level of consciousness that makes them be able to have a metacognition of death. But that's such a, that's a whole rabbit hole. And, like, no one has that answer, so I, we're, I guess beating our heads against the wall. I don't know. Um, okay. Blah, blah, blah. What are we next now? Aha. Okay, this is key. Men were naturally compassionate to one another. This is a key. This is a difference uh, that Rousseau has with Hobbes. He says, uh, let's see, do I want to read this quote? Yeah, okay. He says, Mandeville, and this is Hobbes, uh, Hobbes well knew that in spite of all their morality, men would have never been better than monsters. Had not nature bestowed upon them a sense of compassion to aid their reason. But he did not see that from his quality alone flow 
From this quality alone flow all those social virtues which he denied man the possession. But what is generosity, clemency, or humanity but compassion applied to the weak, to the guilty, or to mankind in general, even constantly set up upon a particular object? For how is it different to wish that another person may not suffer pain and uneasiness and to wish him happy? So he says, Hobbes' state of nature of men as brutish and violent in a constant state of warfare, basically Hobbes only allowed this to exist in his mind because he failed to give men in the natural state a sense of compassion. But Rousseau says that they actually absolutely had a state of compassion. So what do you think about that? I would agree with Rousseau. I mean, I, I definitely... Compassion is something that is, I think, an innate human trait. I don't know how far back in the anthropological or evolutionary record that goes. I mean, if we can take it back to, like, Cro-Magnon or Homo habilis or whatever. Um, but I think you could probably take it back pretty far because, again, even if we look at other species we would consider, quote-unquote, lesser, we see compassion in them as well. Um, so, yeah, I think compassion is, is a natural component that helps offset what would be, uh, uh, in theory, the what he talks about at the beginning, the moral uh, inequalities that could potentially crop up? So this is interesting because I absolutely agree, though it's not actually required for men to have compassion for us to get into societies or to envision, because you and I have talked about the fact that perhaps it's just egoism The fact that if you survive, I personally have a greater chance of survival, that wouldn't be counted as compassion. But if you're purely driven by your own instinctual survival and you recognize that someone else's survival increases your chances of survival, we wouldn't call that compassion, but it would still enable societies to exist. So what do you think about that? But but, but how are we defining compassion at this point? Because then that goes into like the idea of, of, of giving for the sake of giving, right? We all know that if we do charity work, charitable work, we go to a soup kitchen or we donate to uh, organization X, Y, or Z, that that makes us feel good. I am actually, I am receiving something. It's not mm-hmm. a pure benevolent act. I am getting something out of it. To me, that's kind of the same thing. Yes, I understand that me and my natural state am going to do better in a group. There is no solitary human. We already agreed upon that when we were talking about Hobbes. However, even if I understand that we over me leads to a better survival, and maybe I'm doing it for some selfish reasons, does that, and if compassion is a necessary component to make that happen, does that, I don't know, make it not compassion? So let's say you and I are in the state of nature and we exist, and I have an apple and I come across you dying, and I give you an apple because I want you to survive, to me... If I'm doing it solely because I want you to survive and I expect nothing in return, then that is compassion. If I want something in return, that's egoism. Yeah. Obviously, we're going to have to do an episode on, like, Sterner and egoism, etc. once we get there, but... Yeah, I, I, I think it, I think we're simplifying like the compassion a little bit too much on that one. But, but again, I, I would agree that we have it. Whatever. Okay. We have some sort of element that makes us feel a certain way, a kinship, a something with uh, people, with other human beings, and oftentimes other species, but whatever. Mm -hmm. With other human beings, partially because those other human beings are necessary for us to A, survive, and B, diversify our gene pool so I can Mm -hmm. pass on my genes most successfully. But also, I do think there is, at times, a genuine want to do better. And and I don't know what the ratio is of of all three of those elements, but I think they all exist in the same space. So we'll move on from that, and obviously we'll come back to that probably many, many times. So he says that men in the state of nature are compassionate. Then he goes on to explain exactly why men in the civilized state are not compassionate. And I love this quote because it explains why modern man is so callous compared to earlier man. So I'm going to read this whole thing. He says, quote, Now it is plain that such identification must have been much more perfect in the state of nature than in the state of reason. It is reason that engenders self-respect and reflection that confirms it. It is reason which turns man's mind back upon itself and divides him from everything that could disturb or afflict him. It is philosophy that isolates him and bids him say at sight of the misfortunes of others, peril if you will, I am secure. Nothing but such general evil 
Evils as threaten the whole community can disturb the tranquil sleep of the philosopher or tear him from his bed. A murder may, with impunity, be committed under his window. He has only to put his hands to his ears and argue a little with himself to prevent nature, which is shocked within him, from identifying itself with the unfortunate sufferer. Uncivilized man has not this admirable talent, and for want of reason and wisdom is always foolishly ready to obey the first promptings of humanity. It is the populace that flocks together at riots and street brawls, while the wise man prudently makes off. It is the mob and the market women who part uh, the combatants and hinder gentle folk from cutting one another's throats. End quote. What do you think about that? Agree. I, I, I really enjoy what he's saying here. Um, and I think actually uh, it's brave. It's brave during the historical period and the place he's writing um, that he says this, that he is challenging some of those post-enlightenment ideals of scientific empiricism and the classification of things and breaking things down into smaller parts to make them more quote-unquote efficient or productive or so that we can understand them better. Just like I was talking about uh, in the introductory video of why I try and teach history on more of a macro lens rather than this post-structural tiny little lens where I tell a cute little story of a diary entry or something like that. It's because when you break things down so small, they no longer mean anything. And they lose any sort of intrinsic value they had before that, right? Just like to borrow from some work I'm doing on the nation building class, the idea of nationalism comes from this as well. And it didn't start as like nation states. We started to commodify nature, right? And the trees in Germany and that whole process there, the trees no longer had value just as trees. They became commodities. So I, I'm going to use the word commodification because it's in my, that's what's in my vernacular. But I think that's a little bit of what he's talking about here is we, we commodify, we taxonomize, we categorize, we place everything into a tiny box. And we've been doing it more and more efficiently for the past at this point since he's been writing three, uh, three centuries. And that, I think, actually helps in the process of making us bigger assholes, right? Like, that's, it's easier to, de if you're a Nazi, it's easier to dehumanize not a real live human being, but what you have been told is this Jewish person, right? Like, that's much easier because this Jewish person is now being placed in this cute little box, and you think you know everything about them, and you no longer have to have this personal connection. It's much easier to do that process. So, yeah, I, I think he's right on the money with that. Okay. Next, he discusses why in the state of nature the strong did not dominate the weak. This is so crucial because this is such a common argument, specifically when we're discussing anarchy, is that, well, in a state of anarchy, it's might makes right. And the strongest men would just take over everything. And definitely in a state of nature, the strongest would have just dominated everyone, and this is where inequality came from. So Rousseau actually does work to debunk this. So I'm going to read this whole quote. He says, Quote, I hear it constantly repeated that in a, such a state, a state of nature, the strong would oppress the weak. But what is here meant by oppression? Some, it is said, would violently domineer over others, who would groan under a servile submission to their caprices. This indeed is exactly what I observe to be the case among us, but I do not see how it can be inferred of men in a state of nature, who could not easily be brought to conceive what we mean by dominion and servitude. One man, it is true, might seize the fruits which another had gathered, the game he had killed, or the cave he had chosen for shelter, but how would he ever be able to exact obedience, and what ties of dependence could there be among men without possessions? If, for instance, I am driven from one tree, I can go to the next. If I am disturbed in one place, what hinders me from going to another? Again, should I happen to meet with a man so much stronger than myself, and at the same time so depraved, so indolent, and so barbarous as to compel me to provide for his sustenance while he himself remains idle, he must take care not to have his eyes off me for a single moment. He must bind me fast before he goes to sleep, or I shall certainly either knock him on the head or make my escape. That is to say, he must in such a case voluntarily expose himself to much greater trouble than he seeks to avoid or can give me. After all this, let him be off his guard ever so literal, let him but turn his head aside at any sudden noise, and I shall be instantly twenty paces off, lost in the forest, my fetters bust asunder. He would never see me again. So what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, every establishment of state that, that, that we've studied and we've gone through historically and sociologically limits all of those other options that Rousseau was saying, I would do this, I would do that, I would go, I would move to another tree, or I would run off into the woods, or whatever he is saying in this 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 excerpt that you just read, 
every form of the state makes that impossible. And again, if we want to look at a modern society, I don't, if I don't like living in country Y, it's actually a, a extreme pain in the ass to go move to country Z. Regardless of what it is, because I've got to get the right identification, and I have to have the right type of currency, and then I actually have to have enough to investigate citizenship, or maybe I'll get a visa, and there are all these layers of power and bureaucracy that you have to go through that makes it almost not worth it, um, unless you're really in dire circumstances, right? You're a refugee or something along those lines. That's an easy example. Just because you are in a system of power that you don't agree with, getting out of that system is a near impossibility at this point. And if we want to look, if we want to tie this to like ideology class, we critique the hell out of capitalism. Obviously, that's part of the point of the class. How can one, that's the ultimate system of power, there's really no escape at this point, right? Mm -hmm. You are going to participate. That's the funny part. We even make fun of, like, you know, the Marxist clubs and so on and so forth. Like, you're capitalist. You're using, you have a job, you get currency, you use it to go buy other things, right? Like, you're engaging in this process whether you like it or not. So, your number one ideology is capitalism. There's no escape. Your number two ideology could be communism, if that's what you're super into. Cute. That's fine. But you're a capitalist because this is where you live and this is what you do. That's what Rousseau is talking about. If we rewind to this natural state, which is what we're supposed to be focusing on, it could only exist without a state. Only exist. He calls it natural man, but yes, mm -hmm. there will be somebody that is bigger and stronger. There always is. There, there will always be somebody that, that comes along with maybe a little bit different um, physical features that make them more effective at hunting or maybe whatever it is, picking apples. That's fine. They cannot oppress you or make you do anything without the state's help. And he says, he, this is the last sentence from this block quote, he says, It is impossible to make any man a slave unless he be first reduced to a situation in which he cannot do without the help of others. And since such a situation does not exist in a state of nature, everyone is there his own master, and the law of the strongest is of no effect. Absolutely. I mean, again, we, I always like to dive into the animal kingdom, but we see it all the time, right? The, 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 the male lions fight over who gets to be the new leader of the pride, and if the other male lion survives whatever that fight, like, he's not a servant now of that, that, that male lion. He doesn't have to serve him. He gets to go maybe, whatever, go off and to, to, to do his own thing, maybe find his own pride, or come back later when he's stronger and try and beat that dude's ass again, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that's... But he's not... He is not a servant, we should do a whole episode on, like, the Lion King and... <laughs> yeah. The whole thing's bullshit. Okay. <laughs> Next he says, Much like Locke, that man arrives at the concept of private property, though much different than Locke, he says this takes a really, really long time. Uh, and we're not even going to go into really the full length of this, but he says, this is a quote that I like a lot, which he's, this is famous. The first man who, having enclosed a piece of ground, bethought himself of saying, this is mine, and found people simple enough to believe him, was the real founder of civil society. That's simple enough. I love that term. From how many crimes, wars, and murderers, from how many horrors and misfortunes might not anyone have saved mankind by pulling up the stakes or filling up the ditch and crying to his fellows, beware of listening to this imposter, you are undone if you once forget that the fruits of the earth belong to all of us, and the earth itself to nobody. Storytellers. Like, that's my thing when I hear that. Like, yes, there was there was surplus and there was inequity. But when you when you use that word sim simple, that's the first thing I could think of is not just the first guy to mark off his plot of land or learn how to irrigate the Nile or the Tigris or the Euphrates or the Indus or whatever river system we're talking about. Not only just enclose it, but then convince the other simpletons. And I think that's what's like, again, missing in a lot of this philosophy is that convincing, whether we're talking about convincing people that gold is valuable or whatever it is, convincing uh, people because people want to know something. And it is what we talk about. They want to know, why am I here? And what happens when I die? And if you can answer those questions soundly enough, you'll get followers. We There are billions of followers all over the world that will blindly follow anyone that can answer those two questions. This is why I'm here, and this is what will happen when I die, and I will serve you. I will serve you. I will give up my autonomy, and I will serve you. But I can't so help but person... feel like you're fast-forwarding too much. Like the first man in the quote-unquote primitive state that decided that this piece of land was mine agreed. and no one we else's. We disagree that, that, that death, fear of death, was a thing, right? I don't agree with that. 
You don't think so? Okay, so, no. well, Rousseau and I agree, then, a little bit, <laughs> right on that one, that a fear of death was a thing from, like, the get-go. I don't think that without language, well, so, this is, So why did language do initial that? homo sapiens have full human consciousness, in your opinion? I don't know why they wouldn't. I mean, I get that I will probably have a host of anthropologists or biologists or maybe even psychologists that would disagree with that statement. But I, again, I think all, all the, you know how I feel about various disciplines. They get tunnel vision and mm-hmm. refuse to look outside their own tunnels. And I think that's wildly problematic, especially... Although, why don't we see evidences of language until like 45,000 years ago, if that's the case? What do you mean evidence? We don't know. Like, how can we not? They didn't have, there was, we don't have evidence of writing, but that doesn't mean there wasn't evidence of language. Okay, we just now discovered, for example, my favorite example, right? Orcas have different dialects and different languages, right? An orca from South Africa cannot actually communicate that well with an orca from British Columbia. They're not going to leave behind ev- any evidence of that. We just now discovered that. So, Do orcas have awareness of their own death? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. They mourn all the time. But I think this goes to my theory, which is a whole other conversation of, like, the gradations of consciousness. I, I I struggle to find to agree with the fact that very early Homo sapiens had a fully developed linguistic system that allowed them to have metacognition to imagine the fact that they weren't going to survive. Maybe I'm jumping ahead to the more recent work that we're going to talk about here with Graeber, but but he seems to be referencing at earliest this 40k thing. And True. We know Homo sapiens that you're talking about. You're going back to like 250k. Uh, so, well, I mean, we don't know what Rousseau was talking about, I guess. Well, he He's saying he the first it, man. So he wouldn't what? have any of this research available. No, yeah, yeah, so obviously. he did not, yeah. So yeah. he doesn't know how far back it really goes. So maybe he's just making certain assumptions. But I would have to say... He does that, say that they do not have language in the beginning. He he talked extensively about language. I skipped it here because it's kind of boring, but that's in there. No, I think, I think, I think yes, like the first Homo sapien does not have a specific language as we would now know it. But eventually, why does language... Why is language developed? It's one of my favorite, yeah, I'm going to reference now, a guy from more or less the same era, Jonathan Swift. He's not a, he's not a philosopher per se. He's a writer, but he, in his writing engaged in various philosophies and critiques of his society. He's a satirist. Mm-hmm. And in the fourth journey of Gulliver's Travels, he has this, this brief discussion of language. Uh, Gulliver's stranded. He's talking to the Wynnum, uh, the horse person, Wynnum. Um, and the horse decides to, being the representative of what he would call, and Swift uses this word, not me, the savage state, that's what the horse represents, that language only exists so that people can best communicate and work together for their survival. That's why language was invented. And everything thereafter that makes that more difficult, i.e. the development of manipulation and lying, makes language very different. And we could argue, when did that happen? And is that when language actually begins, right? The manipulation. But prior to that, communication the first Homo sapiens, if they were living in a community, they had some form of communication how best to gather or how best to hunt or where to uh, follow herds. They had to be able to communicate. Okay. Whether that's complex language or not, we could debate till we're blue in the face, but they had to be able to coordinate, right? They, you, you cannot work together to coordinate a hunt of whatever they're hunting. Let's make it a gazelle, for lack of a better animal I can think of right this second. To coordinate that sort of attack on gazelles, these humans, they had to be able to communicate. They didn't just, like, run out there together in a group and are all just randomly throwing spears all over the place or whatever they're doing. Okay. But, I mean, that, yeah, we're into, like, semantics now of, like, what's communication. Like, body language is communication, but that doesn't require is that spoken la- but language. It's language. You just yeah, use I agree. Word language. I yes. guess that, yes, now it's a semantics discussion. Yeah. Let's move on. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, fine. He says, how did this begin to happen, this development of the concept of property? He says that as a result of changes in the material world, he says the differences of soils, climates, and seasons must have indu- introduced some differences into the their manner of living. So he suggested as a result of the natural world that men and women would have sought to escape this life of solitude and would start to live together as populations increased, etc. And he says, this is where we see the first beginnings of inequality, because he suggests as they're spending more time together, they would have naturally started comparing themselves to one another. Um, So he says in here, let's see where they have this term. He says they would have Developed terms such as great, small, strong, weak, swift, slow, fearful, bold, and the like, um, almost 
Insensibly compared at need must have at length produced in him a kind of reflection or rather a mechanical prudence, which would indicate to him the precautions most necessary to his security. So he says, as humans began to live together in these smaller groups and the populations grew, they would have at first started to compare themselves to one another. He talks about like the most, the best dancer would have been, uh, etc. identified. He says, as a result, essentially humans begin to develop a sense of self-identity and self-esteem. And this is where status is born, that I am not the biggest, dan the best dancer, that that person is the best dancer, etc. And they would have started comparing themselves to one another. So I don't do know that I fully agree with that. I mean, I can see, I can see his argument that, that certain physical features, maybe if the, the fastest, most agile male hunter comes home with an extra carcass or two that, that, that leads to status and other males will then look to him, uh, look up to him and maybe he'll be able to mate easier or something along those lines. Or maybe uh, one of the matrons has made numerous decisions that were, uh, uh, that consequently led to, I don't know, the proliferation of society, of, this, of their society more effectively or more efficiently. And she had continued to make these good choices, that, politically speaking, she would garner status. I can see that because she might, let me be blunt, might just be smarter than another matron. Fine, I can see that. I don't know if that is the birth of full-blown status. And maybe I'm being informed a little bit by this more recent reading of, 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 of Gravers that we'll get to <laughs> maybe in this podcast um, at this pace. We'll see. Uh, but yeah, that, that, that individualism was understood and individual talents and traits were understood that did not necessarily attach themselves to status. Um, and so maybe I'm being informed a little bit of that by that. I also do think that status has more of a material base. And I do still firmly believe that status arrived with surplus. Okay. Not just talent and ability or different. Well, we're about to get to that. So. Okay. so he says, then natural men began advancing. Uh, by the way, he's saying this takes place over thousands of years. This isn't like a short story. Right, but just like we do. Yeah, yeah, obviously. Just like what we do. Um, so he says then they develop the concept of, he doesn't want to call it property, but he uses kind of the term possession. Um, and this is when he starts to delineate himself uh, further from Locke, where Locke says that the initial possessions are what begin the slippery slope down to social inequality, uh, Rousseau disagrees. So he says, I quote, However, the strongest were probably the first to build themselves huts, which they felt themselves able to defend. It may be concluded that the weak found it much easier and safer to imitate than to attempt to dislodge them. And of those who were once provided with huts, none could have any inducement to appropriate that of his neighbor. Not indeed so much because it did not belong to him as because it could be of no use, and he could not make himself master of it without exposing himself to a desperate battle with the family who occupied it. So he's saying that, let's say a man built his hut, and he says the strongest and smartest would have been the first to do this, but no one would have came along and attempted to take that hut from them because they could have easily just imitated them and built their own hut. That imitation would have been far easier than conquest. So what do you think about that? Well, again, in, in going back far enough, yeah, I mean, it, with the idea of, or the perception, it's not reality, we now know that, but the perception of unlimited resources or available land, then of course, imitation is going to be a lot easier than, than, than arming up and engaging in any sort of battle or fighting. I, guess I don't disagree with anything he says there. Okay, he says, now men, humans start to form many societies and we see the division of labor. So he says, the first expansions of the human heart were the effects of novel situation, which united husbands and wives, father and children under one roof. This is what he calls his mini societies, the family, essentially. The habit of living together soon gave rise to the finest feelings known to humanity, conjugal love and paternal affection. Every family became a little society, the more united because liberty and reciprocal attachment were the only bonds of its union. The sexes whose manner of life had been hitherto the same began now to adopt different ways of living. The women became more sedentary and accustomed themselves uh, 
to mine the hut and their children, while the men went abroad in search of their common subsistence. From living a softer life, both sexes also began to lose something of their strength and ferocity. But if individuals became to some extent less able to encounter wild beasts separately, they found it, on the other hand, easier to assemble and resist in common. So what do you think? Most of my, what I've researched in the communities I've researched, that, that seems to fall relatively well in line. I mean, you know, without getting into semantics, I think that sounds pretty fair. I don't have much of a bone to pick there. I mean, we okay. can see it in, in, in most of what we would call... Our, our complex, to use the, the language of the anthropologists, our complex hunter-gatherer societies, we do see a little bit of a gender division of labor bring up. And then we do see that the basis of all social organization starts in family and based on the ideas, and he uses this word, I appreciate him using it, re reciprocity, right? Mm -hmm. And from the family, we go up to higher levels to diversify the gene pool, right? From family to clan and from clan to what we would call tribe or nation and then on and on and on. Okay, then I'm just going to read this one sentence that goes back to what we were talking about with status, etc. He says, In this state of these many societies, whoever sang or danced best, whoever was the handsomest, the strongest, the most dexterous, or the most eloquent came to be of most consideration. And this was the first step towards inequality, and at the same time towards vice. From these first distinctions arose on the one side vanity and contempt, and on the other shame and envy. And the fermentation caused by these new leavens ended by producing combinations fatal to innocence and happiness. I mean, I could see a little bit of that, but I, I, I still don't want to attach it to full-blown status, which I think is what he's, he's leaning towards here before we have the establishment of a full-blown state until we're talking about the quote-unquote birth of civilization in these city-states of whatever, Ur or Iraq or, you know, mm -hmm. the, the Egyptian empires and so on and so forth. I don't, I don't think we're fully there yet. I definitely see differentiate. These aren't like little communes where everybody's the same, a little automaton. There's definitely difference, but I don't know if that if that difference meant stratification. Well, I don't think he's suggesting that either at this point. He's, he's saying this saying is just the very the, beginnings. Yeah, it's just the origins of what status might be. Mm -hmm. Totally. I mean, that's the whole point of the work. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're about to get to more of when he starts solidifying it. So this is just his process of what he says is happening. He says that this eventually evolved into revenge and warfare. He says, thus, as every man punished the contempt shown him by others in proportion to his opinion of himself, revenge became terrible and men bloody and cruel. However, he takes a moment to point out that even though this was happening, this was still a happy and stable existence. He said, thus, though men had become less patient and their natural compassion had already suffered some diminution, this period of expansion of the human faculties keeping a just mean between the indolence of the primitive state and the petulant activity of our egoism must have been the happiest and most stable of epochs. The more we reflect on it, the more we shall find that this state was the least subject to revolutions and altogether the very be best man could experience, so that he can have departed from it only through some fatal accident, which for the public good should never have happened. The example of savages, most of whom have been found in this state, seem to prove that men were meant to remain in it, that it is the real youth of the world, and that all subsequent advances have been apparently so many steps towards the perfection of the individual, but in reality towards the decrepitude of the species. We all over, I'm guilty of it too, so I'm kind of liking Rousseau in this one, of over-romanticizing this state, whatever this magic state is, uh, along, along the evolutionary scale. Like, we, how, how do we stop there and then not keep going? Like, how is that the, the magic point? I don't know. Uh, but I do agree with his assessment. Again, if we just want to even critique our modern societies where, we, yes, we have all of these wonderful amenities and we are comfortable and, and I don't have to wonder where my meal, or at least a lot of us are privileged in, 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 in the industrialized world to not know where our next meal is or we can turn our next meal is coming from or we can turn on a tap. Yes, I get that that is not the case for all seven and a half billion to eight billion people. Um, but that's because of the inequality we're trying to solve here with this discussion. It could be, uh, some of our advances could get us there, but we're exploring why we choose, as advanced as we are, not to do that. And I think that's one of the things that, that I agree with him most is alongside these, alongside this advancement or this evolutionary process or this technological advancement, for, for lack of a better term, it comes naturally hinged to the system's ideas, ideologies of inequity of status and I think that's that's one of those things that's attached to it 
I do believe that he is incorrect, that, that we see in these <clears throat> modern societies, and he must have been experiencing it again in the 18th century as well, we're not happy. We have all of this, especially in the most advanced societies. We have all of these wonderful things, but we're not happy. We are constantly searching for happiness. And again, I will pick on modern society. We're miserable, right? Especially, again, when we look at, uh, I will now be citing Lottery of Birth, the film, right? The UK and the United States, right? These are some of the most uh, narcotized societies that have ever existed. Why do we need so many narcotics to get through the day from caffeine to nicotine to THC to Ritalin to you name it, right? Why that you shouldn't require those to get through the day just to make it through. That's not happiness, right? We don't need, you know, these societies did not have alcoholism and they didn't have this much uh, 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 mental illness, right? We understand. We now know that. Now, is that because of the way of life or is it something else? I argue it is clearly because of the way of life, right? There's just so much less pressure. Um, yeah, I, I think I think he's actually quite on the money with this stuff. Again, just merely looking at, at all of the problems in our society. I, I could go on and on regarding our need for online social media personalities and reaffirmation through likes and so on and so forth. It's, it's only getting worse and shit. That's just in our lifetime. So, yeah, yeah, I'll stop now before this podcast becomes, you know, four hours. Okay, then he gets to really the turning point for him, and this is what informs the next, I mean, still to this day, theory of how social inequality came into beginning. He says that there's a significant change in the way that human beings began to uh, live and organize themselves uh organized amongst each other. He says, metallurgy and agriculture were the two arts which produced this great revolution. Mm -hmm. The poets tell us it was gold and silver, but for the philosophers, it was iron and wheat, which first civilized men and ruined humanity. I mean, it seems to coincide with what is being critiqued now by some people in, in certain circles. But yes, it's those two coincide with what we call the Neolithic Revolution or the agriculture of whatever terminology we like. Yes, those were two necessary steps for that revolutionary process. I do want to preface it when we use that terminology in all future podcasts. We understand that this agriculture slash Neolithic Revolution is not an overnight process. We reference it um, whether we're referencing it or we're speaking to other academics, most reference it as a process that took thousands of years. It's not an overnight revolution. It is not, you know, whatever. There's no guillotines involved. It doesn't, you know, reign of terror. Then he goes on to try to discuss how this came into being, and he fully admits he has no idea how human beings ever discovered uh, metallurgy. He says, it's difficult to conjecture how men first came to know and use iron, for it is impossible to suppose they would have themselves think of digging the ore out of a mine and preparing it for smelting before they knew what would be the result. And then he has another section, which I think is actually comedic. Uh, I didn't include it here, but he talks about how, like, how could you possibly, like, did lightning strike a mine? Like, it's impossible. Like, it's just impossible throughout the natural course of things that men discovered this. But I'm sure that we now know some theories for how this came into being, but Rousseau admits that he has uh, no idea. He says it's a little different for the methods of agriculture because it would have been really easy for men uh, in the state of nature just throughout their daily yeah, course of I mean, life to figure it's this the observable out. observable world, right? Yeah, right? Exactly. We understand that water and sunlight and growing seasons, and we've been observing mm -hmm. that for thousands of years as quote-unquote gatherers. So, yeah, absolutely. I, that, that's easy to observe. I agree with Rousseau. How did somebody learn how to smelt iron? I I. I don't have any ideas on that. I'm I mean, sure some anthropologists As a, as a tell historian, us, I should yeah. probably know this, but it's not a period of history I spend a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure an anthropologist could tell us. But, um, though he does say that even though they would have figured out agriculture, that there probably was a very long period of time when they would not have done it because the effort to put in the work to have agriculture wouldn't have been worth the returns. And this right. is a common theory in anthropology. So that, I just is. wanted to note that. Okay, then he says, uh, this is really where we're getting into the uh, body of this that's important for our future conversations. He says, the invention of other arts must therefore have been necessary to compel mankind to apply themselves to agriculture. No sooner were artificers wanted to smelt and forge iron than others were required to maintain them. The more hands that were employed in manufactures, the fewer were left to provide for the common substance. Substance. Subsistence. Through the number of mouths to be furnished with food remained the same. 
And as some required commodities in exchange for their iron, the rest at length discovered the method of making iron serve for the multiplication of commodities. By this means, the arts of husbandry and agriculture were established on the one hand, and the art of working metals and multiplying their uses on the other. So, so the he, farmers have to find a way to feed the, the, the exactly. iron workers, and there has to be some sort of exchange of labor for that food. A hundred percent. And it's this division of labor. That, yeah. yeah. It's this division of labor, the fact that as soon as people were working in some kind of quote-unquote industry that wasn't directly resulting in subsistence, i.e. farming, essentially, or hunting, that the farmers, like you just said, had to find a way to support them. And also, the ones that were working in quote-unquote non-productive uh, roles were now dependent on those that were, and that's key. But there is a little reciprocity still mm -hmm. there. The farmer, totally. to be better at his job, needs now those metal tools. He has become dependent. He's lost the skills mm -hmm. to farm because that happens over thousands of years, too. We see that all the time yeah. during the colonial period, right? And that's not even hundreds, thousands of years. That's decades that that happens where you become dependent upon these more useful tools that you forget how to make or do things before they even existed. So the farmer is also somewhat dependent upon the metal, the, the, the mm -hmm. iron worker, the We'll actually get to that in a second. Yeah. He says, things at this point are still equal. So he says, uh, now we're talking about the birth of property. The cultivation of earth necessarily brought about its distribution, and property, once recognized, gave rise to the first rules of justice. For to secure each man his own, it had to be possible for each to have something. Besides, as men began to look forward to the future and all had something to lose, everyone had reason to apprehend that reprisals would follow any in injury he might do to another. This origin is so much the more natural as it is impossible to conceive how property can come from anything but manual labor. For what else can a man add to things which he does not originally create, so as to make them his own private property? So he's saying that as they started applying their labor to these now physical things, this is where the concept of uh, property comes from. I don't think that's anything that's sort of revolutionary. That... No, no. <clears throat> so he says... I mean, it, it ties back into the power process that we yeah. want to experience the fruits of our labor. If I'm going to do something, I want to make... Something tangible must come from it that I get to enjoy. Mm -hmm. so. Um... This initial division of labor resulted in inequality, and this is now moral and political inequality, not just natural inequality. In this state of affairs, equality might have been sustained had the talents of individuals been equal, and had, for example, the use of iron and consumption of commodities always exactly balanced each other. But as there was nothing to preserve this balance, it was soon disturbed. The strongest did the most work, the most skillful turned his labor to best account, the most ingenious devised methods of diminishing his labor. The husbandman wanted more iron, or the smith more corn, and while both labored equally, the one gained a great deal by his work by the, while the other could hardly support himself. Thus natural inequality unfolds itself insensibly, what with that of combination, and the difference between men developed by their different circumstances becomes more sensible and permanent in its effects and begins to have an influence in the same proportion over the lot of individuals. So, again, I think that, that now we have to have a discussion about what era he's talking about, because I would argue that that <clears throat> is around the time of what I would call the birth of states. Now, mm -hmm. he seems to be indicating it's slightly before that, before mm -hmm. we have established whatever, yeah. King Narmer of Egypt or something along those lines. That's fine. He seems to be insinuating it slightly before that, but I would call those at least early on. Those are those are becoming states, right? Those even if they're a little bit more egalitarian than the great kingdoms of Egypt or Mesopotamia that we would we may be talking about a little bit later. So be it. But I still think that we're entering into early state status, city state status, whatever it is. So then he says, he asked the question basically, why didn't people reflect on the situation and realize it was miserable? Uh, so this is his quote. It is impossible that men should not at length have reflected on so wretched a situation and on the calamities that overwhelmed them. The rich, in particular, must have felt how much they suffered by a constant state of war, of which they bore all the expense, and in which, though all risked their lives, they alone risked their property. So I just want to pause for a second and say how ridiculous it is for Rousseau to say of all the people that suffer throughout this, the rich suffer the most. Yeah. Just as an aside, absolutely absurd. Okay. And risking their lives, we already know, a system of the down told us, they always send the poor. 
Okay, back in the quote. Besides, however, speciously they might disguise their usurpations, and this is the wealthy he's talking about, they knew that they were founded on precarious and false titles, so that if others took from them by force what they themselves had gained by force, they would have no reason to complain. Even those who had been enriched by their own industry could hardly base their proprietorship on better claims. It was in vain to repeat, I built this well, I gained this spot by my industry. Who gave you your standing, it might be answered, and what right have you to demand payment of us for doing what we never asked you to do? Do you not know that numbers of your fellow creatures are starving for want of what you have too much of? You ought to have had the express and universal consent of mankind before appropriating more of the common subsistence than you needed for your own maintenance. Destitute of valid reasons to justify and sufficient strength to defend himself, able to crush individuals with ease, but easily crushed himself by a troop of bandits, one against all and incapable on account of mutual jealousy, of joining with his equals against numerous enemies, united by the common hope of plunder, the rich man, thus argued by necessity, conceived at length the profoundest plan that ever entered the mind of man. This was to employ in his favor the forces of those who attacked him, to make allies of his adversaries, to inspire them with different maxims, and to give them other institutions as favorable to himself as the law of nature was unfavorable. So you already know I agree with this. This this follows almost perfectly with the whole pyramid theory that I like to use in our mm -hmm. classes. And, and for those of you that have time, if you visit our website, there's probably a video posted of, of the mini lecture version of that, a 10 to 15 minute version of it. And it, and it follows perfectly in line with, with this idea. So I'm actually glad to hear that, that I'm at least in agreement with this great, you know, whatever, I don't know about great, but highly respected <laughs> philosopher. Who, who uh, so said. then he says, then civil government is born. He says, with this view, after having represented to his neighbors the horror of a situation which armed every man against the rest and made their possessions at burdensome, uh, as burdensome to them as their wants, and which no safety could be expected either in riches or in poverty, he readily devised plausible arguments to make them close with his design. Let us join, said he, to guard the weak from oppressing, oppression, to restrain the ambitious and secure every man the possession of what belongs to him. Let us institute rules of justice and peace, to which all without exception may be obliged to conform, rules that may in some measure make amends for the caprices of fortune, by subjecting equally the powerful and the weak to the observances of reciprocal obligations. Let us, in a word, instead of turning our forces against ourselves, collect them in a supreme power which may govern us by wise laws, protect and defend all the members of the association, repulse their common enemies, and maintain inter internal harmony among us. Far fewer words to this purpose would have been enough to impose on men so barbarous and easily seduced, especially as they had too many disputes among themselves to do without arbitrators, and too much ambition and avarice to go along without masters. All ran headlong to their chains in hope of securing their liberty, for they had just wit enough to perceive the advantages of political institutions without experience enough to enable them to foresee the dangers. The most capable of foreseeing the dangers were the very persons who expected to benefit by them, and even the most prudent judged it not inexpedient to sacrifice one part of their freedom to ensure the rest, as a wounded man as has his arm cut off to save the rest of his body. Again, it's, uh, it follows almost perfectly in line. He even uses the word supreme being that he is preying upon this idea, and I don't know if that's what he meant, but the idea of... These people will willingly submit if I give them something to serve that is higher, right? Some sort of higher power, some sort of higher notion of what that is. If that is the war god Enlil in Mesopotamia, or, or uh, Horus incarnate the pharaoh in Egypt, or, or whoever that may or may not be, that gives pe it, it not just gives people the idea, as he's talking about, a more material comfort in this political system or this social stratification, but I think it speaks to the development, again, of ideology as well, which I, I would argue he's... He's glossing over rather quickly and the role of story, but I think he's still, I think he's meaning to discuss it, and maybe that's just the terminology he chose to use. He he's, using, he's using the word arguing, and mm -hmm. but, but that argument is what I would call, if we were teaching this in a class, the development of a narrative, a specific mm -hmm. narrative. What would come from this would be the Epic of Gilgamesh, or 
right? The palette of Narmer, right? Like those are the things that I would be discussing as these are arguments, right? Mm -hmm. These are arguments as to why you are willingly going to submit and give up your autonomy to serve this power. Like he obviously doesn't use the term ideology because it hasn't been invented yet. Right, and right. the Marxist conception of ideology isn't till long past his time. But I mean, that's what he's talking about, right? He's yeah. talking about exactly like the wealthy invented a story to convince the oppressed yeah, to join simple. into a government. Yeah, the simple, exactly. Yeah. That's exactly what he's saying, right? And it still works, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I mean, I've got no issue with this. this. We all believe in a story and we willingly submit because we're told to and, and the story makes us feel good. So he says, such was or may well have been the origin of society and law, which bound new fetters on the poor and gave new powers to the rich, which irretrievably destroy, destroyed natural liberty, eternally fixed the law of property and inequality, converted clever usurpation into unalterable right, and, for the advantage of a few ambitious individuals, subjected all mankind to perpetual labor, slavery, and wretchedness. And unalterable with laws, I mean, we know that, that writing and laws tended to go hand in hand. Hammurabi's Code, those 282 laws, and then later on, the laws of Moses, right? Like, they, we began to write them down seeking that permanence, that this stratification, this inequality, this exploitation will remain permanent. The status quo will remain permanent. Law is one of the most oppressive things that we've created. I know, again, in our narratives and modern societies that we're supposed to uh, revere laws and uphold them, and we live in a, a society above laws, but our narratives are the ones that tell us that laws are something to be revered. No one's ever asked, what if there was a society without? And when people do, they're chastised for it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So he's basically saying the inequality resulted in war over surplus, which led to the wealthy, the elite, eventually employing those who attacked them to protect their surplus, and finally to imposing civil society to protect their material goods and their status. Essentially, the non-wealthy were duped into consenting, thinking that the arrangement would result in their liberty somehow. However, it only strengthened uh, their change. It only increased and essentially codified uh, their oppression. So, in short, metallurgy and agriculture began the slippery slope uh, to exploitation and the hoarding of property. Uh, that's Rousseau's theory. So, what do we think about that? I, yeah, without getting long-winded, I, I, I mean, we've gone through the comments, you know, quote by quote, and I think it does fall really well in line with the way we've been approaching things. Um, I know at some point we're going to try and approach this from a, an antithetical point of view, that somebody that will challenge Rousseau's very uh, uh, linear uh, approach to this, and that's that's good. But I, the trajectory, the history, the anthropology, the archaeology, a lot of it seems to point in this direction. I do know that recent discoveries have began to to change some things, but I don't know that they're changing it as much as they like to think they're changing it. I think again, these are only minor deviations in modern scholarship, which again, I don't know that I want to approach right this second. We'll probably be getting that to that very soon, though. So I will say that. Like Hobbes, and in contrary to Locke, Rousseau admits that this is hypothetical and a thought experiment as well. Right. So he actually has a quote where he specifically says, The investigations we may enter to in treating this subject must not be considered as historical truths, but only as mere conditional and hypothetical reasonings, rather calculated to explain the nature of things than to assert their actual origin. So, the whole thing's subjective based yeah. on our knowledge, right? And not only our knowledge, but our own socialized biases that are now built in because there are clear arguments that we're trying to make, and we mm -hmm. definitely manipulate information to make that happen. But did we find out, like, our... So I just want one final critique of Rousseau that I have. My final critique is just like the critique of Hobbes, is that he envisions man as being solitary in his natural state. Um, which obviously we have a problem with, but I, they all kind of get off the hook because we have the liberty of having so much more anthropological uh, evidence um, at our disposal now. So I don't know, but that's just my final critique of Rousseau. So Rousseau's theory, basically that agriculture and industry gave birth to surplus, which gave birth to inequality, comes to dominate the discourse uh, really up until today. Uh, so we're going to stop this episode here, and then the next episode will be discussing modern anthropological evidence that seeks to challenge Rousseau's hypothesis, basically the hypothesis of the agricultural uh, revolution. So we'll do that during the next episode. So um, we're not ready yet to fully answer that, that original question, are humans 
quote unquote, I think, as Nick put it, good or bad. And of course, those are both loaded words, but you guys get the idea. Yeah, we should be able to make a more serious conclusion there, at least uh, in the next episode. So tune into that. You can get the show notes for this episode and link with us online at revolutionandideology.com. Uh, if you want to contact us, you can do that at hello at revolutionandideology.com. So thanks for tuning in. Uh, we'll hope that you'll continue this conversation with us in the next episode when we'll be analyzing the more modern evidence uh, for some of those things. Uh, we'll talk to you next time. See ya.